Prime recently, he lost his wife to cancer, leaving him with his two young boys. Please welcome Michael Dignan. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, a lot of people know you from the Sunday game, and a, a lot of people then will know you from the great, awfully hurling team of, of the 90s, who uh, you were as much fun off the pitch, I suppose, as you were on the pitch, weren't you? We had a good bit of crack along the way, yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose a special team, a lot of very, very talented players, and uh, we were popular, I think, because of our style of play. We uh, had some very, very skillful players, Brian Whelan, who was on the team of the Millennium, and the Dooleys, and John Troy, and all those great players, the Pilkington. So um, we were a popular team. Um, I think we had the right attitude. We were serious about our hurling, but when we were in the close season, we had a bit of crack as well, and yeah. maybe a lot of that's gone out of the GA now. Like, it Do you think it is like, yeah? Well, I think, yeah, it, it is very, very serious. There wasn't a lot of science I'm taking in your, in your day or anything. And, you know. well, the, well, I think we, we had a reputation of not training that much, which wasn't really yeah. true. We did train very, very hard, but we had a great laugh as well, and we were from more or less from the same area, like Offaly is a small county, and the hurling mm -hmm. area is a very small part, so we knew each other well growing up. We were all great friends. Uh, all the families knew each other, so it was really like one big family, and... Uh, we had a great laugh along, along the way and great times. I was asking a guy, a, a guy during the week, because uh, I wouldn't know a whole lot about hurling. I was, I was saying, so I, I believe that, you know, they enjoyed a good time and all this kind of thing. They fell from awfully. And he said, well, I don't really know. And I said, I believe they were colourful on the pitch. And, and he said, look, they were awfully men. <laughs> and that seemed to sum it up for him. Yeah, well, D Dublin were training at 6 o'clock in the morning this year. And one of our lads was asked, what would you thought, John Troy? What would you thought of training at 6 o'clock in the morning? And John said it would have been handy. We could have done it on the way home. <laughs> so, yeah. so listen uh, you, you've written the book Life, Death and Hurling and, and, and a lot about hurling but a lot about life and death as well and I suppose particularly the, your, your wife Adele who died of cancer at the age of 41 so was it, it, the book it's a difficult enough read it's a, it's, a, like, it's, a sad, it's a sad book it was very difficult to write um, I suppose it was yeah um, we started it about 12 months ago and I suppose it was fairly raw. The emotions were fairly raw at the time. But uh, Adele was only dead a year. Only dead about a year when we started at it, yeah. And yeah. Uh, really what happened was, you know, from, first of all, from a GA point of view, I would never have thought about writing a book. I was an average player on a great team. And we had... I know. Well, no, but genuine about it. You had the Brian Whelans and the Dooleys and, in football, Martin Furlong and Mark, Matt Connor, all those great players. Uh, but no Offaly player had actually ever written a book, uh, which was unusual. You know, a lot mm. of lads write books now when they retire or whatever. And that was a bit of a backdrop. And Pat Nolan, who co-wrote the book for me, is from Tullamore, a hugely passionate GA man. And he kind of approached me. And then Liam Hayes, uh, who used to play with Mead, who published yeah. the book, um, Irish Sports Publishing, he had cancer last year himself. And Liam approached me and they sort of got me around the table and said, look, we, you know, we think there's a st great story there, you know, some of your profile. And then I got thinking about it. And I suppose really the motivation was people that do suffer from cancer that are going through life in general that have difficulties maybe. Yeah. Uh, all sorts of things. And... I think the story of, you know, you go up to James's hospital where Adele was going for all those years and see the people in there and the dignity, the way they carry themselves, the way they accept what's happening to them yeah. and the way they take it on. So I felt it was an important story there. And then I suppose dealing with it myself or not dealing with it yeah. and not talking about things. And you see that throughout Irish life and everything. I suppose yeah. men don't talk about things. Yeah. And I just felt maybe it would be a help to people if I wrote the book. And I wrote it from the heart. I didn't get anyone to read it. I didn't get anyone to edit it along the way. Yeah. It was kind of my story, the way I saw it. I didn't want anyone to sort of blink with my vision, so yeah, I, I did it. And you tell the story very flatly in, in plain language and everything. T take us back to, how did you and Adele meet? Um, we met in the bank, when the bank was a nice place to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when there was the low, yeah, I was transferred to Ratfarnham in 1990 AIB and Adele had just been transferred in there, so um, but you, I believe you were both with, with other people initially, yes? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, nothing too serious, but we were, okay. yeah, we were tipping yeah. around, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you do, and uh, so, um, yeah, we got together then, and uh, sort of from there on, and we were, yeah, we were together for 19 years then after that. And listen, um, so you got married, had kids and everything, obviously, uh, as it does do with the woman, it, changes, it changed Adele's life and lifestyle hugely. I, I gather from the book, and fair play to you, like, you don't make out you were husband of the century all the time or anything, and a lot of guys at home are squirming in the seats now because, again, mm. you possibly didn't change your lifestyle so much initially no. when the kids I didn't came change it. I didn't change it at all, to be honest with you. Right. Um, and I say it, and, like, looking back on it, it's incredible, really, how selfish I was, but I think that's part and parcel of being an inter-county GA player, particularly when you're successful. You don't think of anybody really only yourself. And you have to be a bit that Really, way. yeah? You have to be very single-minded. Well, that's the way I found it. And a lot of lads yeah. have said it to me since reading the book, even ex-teammates, 
that they were the same. That she must be unbearable, are you? Yeah, pain in the arse now. To really? Be yeah. And uh, <laughs> you know, but lads, like you get into fierce bad form coming up to big matches, and you'd be would be unbearable. But what basically happened was. It would be all about you, you know, training. You'd be training three or four or five times a week. And I was living in Dublin or living in Ace, so it was up and down. So I'd be gone from, say, work seven o'clock in the morning, might be home till 12 at night. And then when you were off, you were too tired to do anything or you were resting or you were this, that or the other. Yeah. And then when I gave it up then, I said, I'll try after having 15 years of this. I deserve to let the hair down. <laughs> <now and laughs> go to the beer like three nights no. a week with the lads and play yeah. golf and all this type of thing. And that's what I did yeah. um, a fair bit now. And Adele often said she didn't, she, like she was easy going and she didn't mind a certain yeah. amount of it, but like I did overdo it at times and uh, you mentioned in the book about going to the I know we don't mention the Fianna Fáil tent at the Galway races anymore but you, you invited down to the Fianna Fáil tent at the Galway races and you and Adele went for a day down there and then and then Adele went home the next day and I stayed on for a few days so <laughs> not in the Fianna Fáil tent no, <laughs> so you, you did four days I did three or four days I believe yeah, yeah yeah and she kind she did kind of um she well, like of, enough was enough at, you yeah. know, at any stage. But was that I, a tipping point, yeah? That was probably a tipping point, yeah, yeah and uh, we changed, you know. But then Adele had been sick at that stage originally with, her, with, yeah. with the breast cancer. So it was 2002 she got the breast cancer 2002 first. 2002 right? first, she was yeah. only 34, and uh, um, she had surgery and treatment, chemo and radiotherapy. About 12 months that lasted, and we moved from Nace down to Tullamore in that period. So, yeah. um, But then she recovered, and she had four years clear, so, you know, things kind of got back to fairly normal she went back to yeah. work and you know we, we thought she was over the over the hump and like it, i should say as well you had a great old relationship you could see it from the book how you were mad about ah, yeah, yeah. and Adele liked a good time as well yeah and a lot of pictures in the book absolutely it was, it was just really that yeah. i didn't really grow up you know i, I yeah. kept doing my own thing and um until i suppose the last few years then so 2006 then she got uh, another prognosis which was kind of which was terminal secondary yeah. cancer yeah which is terminal which i think I think that's the big distinction in cancer as well. When primary cancer, there's some, you know, there's hope there, and there should be hope that, you know, people can recover, and they are, they are recovering all the time from cancer. Yeah. It's not all doom and gloom, but, um, but once, unfortunately, once you get secondary cancer, that's it. Like that's that was, it. that was a totally different perspective on things, and trying to accept that and get your head around that wasn't easy. And and she was she was given a, a prognosis then of like what, about 12, 12 months or twelve maybe eighteen months. Uh, and she lasted about three. Because she said to you when you, came, when you came out after it, she said, I'm, go I'm going to make it to, was it Brian's, Brian's communion? communion yeah. Which was three years off. Yeah. The, yeah. the pattern day in Doro, where we live outside Tullamore, is always the communion, the 9th of June every year. So yeah. it was that week that um, Adele was diagnosed, and Brian's communion was three years on, and she was just had, had been told that she was going to die, basically. And, and she, she, right. qui she quizzed, she pushed John Kennedy, the oncologist, hard to know how long she had. That's the way she was. Yeah. She wanted to know, and he eventually said, gave in, and he said, look, maybe 12 months or whatever, it's in your liver, it's in your spine, whatever. And uh, she said, I'll be at Brian's communion. And that was, I said, that's an incredible thing. I knew it was three years down the road. Like, but where, how she picked it out of, I don't know, but she, she was there for then. Um, and, and come here, you, you mentioned there earlier about you know, people not talking about things and stuff. Presumably, at that point, you have to have some very hard and sad conversations. You like, yeah. Well, we didn't initially. You know, we found it hard enough. You know, we kind of tiptoed around it for a while. But then, as after a few months, we started getting into it. And it is like, I, I, I don't want to be sound flippant about it or anything yeah. like that. But you know, you start talking about funeral arrangements and you know who's going to sing at your funeral and who's going to say readings and all this type of stuff. And it's kind of very surreal when you're, when it's going on. But. The funny thing about it all was, yeah. we'd start off with a will, doing a will, and I kind of said to Adele, sure, I could be knocked down by a bus in the morning or killed in a car yeah. crash, we should have a will. And kind of when we got going on it and doing it, it was a great relief when we had done those yeah, things. you kind of say in the book that you were able to move on and yeah. live, live a bit then once you... Yeah, we kind of put them, we kind of said, that, that's it. And Adele said, look, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die tomorrow. I yeah. hope I'm going to make the most of it. And we got those things done and we, we kicked on and we had... Like we really had a great time for the last few years. I like you can you can tell from from the book like that. In a way, like it's as, like not again not to be flippant about it, but the fact of the death being a certainty there somewhere did seem to make you appreciate life a bit more. And yeah, and simple things in life, you know. And yeah. back to you know, I talk about basic holiday, appreciating Ireland and the sea and uh, yeah, you know, simple things in life and yeah. and being with your family or whatever. But listen, also the thing the thing that struck me, Michael, is you. Like, as someone who hasn't gone through anything remotely like this, I know a lot of people have, a lot of people watching won't have. You go, you go into a situation here, once that happened, you went into a situation where you had to do all these things that really no family should ever have to do. You had to have, like, for example, after the communion, 
you had to sit your two young fellas down and basically tell them their mum was dying, yeah? Yeah, um, when we had to, and we always kept them, you know, there were only young lads, obviously, at the time, they're only 13, 11 now, so they were only, you know, they were, were 11, 9, at that st or 11 and 9, yeah? Yeah. So, you know, we would have always kept them, they knew Adele had cancer, they knew that she was getting treatment, but eventually, that summer, like, we knew time was running out, so we had to sit them down and say that she wasn't going to get better, and it is, it's very, very hard to do. I don't think, you know, at that age in your life, you're not prepared for that, you're not, obviously, you know, you shouldn't be doing that type of thing, but that's, unfortunately, the way it was, but we... It was very important to, you know, to, to be honest with them, and so they knew that it wasn't going to be a huge shock to them out of the blue, you know, and, and yeah, that was sort of it was professional advice, but it was also our own gut feeling, like we knew sort of what to say to them and when to say to them. So, um, and they they accepted it, you know, which is incredible. Like they would have given me a lot of strength. They they would have accepted it in their own way and put it in uh, put it in the box and moved on with life. And yeah. you know, they would be they'd be an inspiration to me in the way they've dealt with it. And, and listen, you did go on, you talk about appreciating the simple things. One of the warmest parts of the book, you talk about that last holiday you had. And I know you used to go on, on great sun holidays and with the team and everything, you went to Florida and everything. This was a holiday that began, and I'm not saying anything about Leitrim, it began in, in Leitrim of all places. But, and you're, you're conscious, I suppose, that you're conscious your wife is dying. The kids somewhere in their head know that mom is dying. Did you kind of think this is our last adventure, know, yeah, last I, I, holiday? Yeah, it, it probably was there. You know, your, your conscious as time moves, went on that it was going, time was getting shorter. But like Adele was so strong physically as well as mentally that, you know, I think people sort of forget. And she wouldn't go out in public unless she was in good form or she wouldn't meet people unless she was pretty much up to it. So, yeah, um, yeah so I, I think we did. The two of us had a fair idea that it might be the last time. But it didn't take over the holiday. But we, you say we started off in Leitrim. We were never in Leitrim. Don't ask me why we went there. Yeah. Adele had a brother in Sligo. She still has. So we went to Leitrim for a few days. And uh, I got up on a horse, got help to horse. And <laughs> a few things like that. And you're yeah. reading the mines and boiled fat. Simple things. And yeah. we went on then to Sligo. And we went down to Connemara. And we went to Clare and Kilkee. And, you know, all yeah. lovely times. And then and it was the, the end of that summer. In the end, it, she... She got pneumonia, wasn't it? And she went downhill yeah. quite, quite quickly. Yeah, the day before the they learned in, in 2009, um, she just had a bit of a temperature. And I was commentating on the learned the next day with Gerald Canning. So yeah. I got up and the next morning and she, uh, Adele took her temperature and it was high. So she rang her sister, Linda, who's a nurse in, uh, in Port Leash, and Linda came over. I went off and did the match, not thinking anything of it. And James had said, come in for, you know, you can't fight infection when you're, when you're on the chemo. So yeah. she went in and that was it. She didn't come out and yeah. she just got... She got uh, pneumonia, and that's eventually what got her. But she went off very peacefully, and she didn't suffer, yeah. which, you know, you have that, the way the, she wanted. The, 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 you say she had, like, she had a nice death and died. Yeah. And thing. What, tell, tell them about um, what the, the priest said when he came out of her room after, remember, after he'd been... Father Simon, yeah, yeah, he was a family friend and a, a great, uh, you know, he got to know him in Lourdes a few years ago. But, yeah, he went in on one of the nights, and he came out maybe the night before she died, and he said to me, look, don't worry about it, and she's grand. And he, he said... In all my time in the priest, I've never met anyone who's so prepared, who's, who's so prepared to die like so. Yeah. That she, she was completely accepting of, of the fact that, she, and, and she had very strong faith. So, like, I don't know how she did it. I wouldn't be able to do it, I don't think, but she did it. And, yeah. Uh, was, and yeah. she accepted it, and, you know, it was, she, was, she was tough and brave. And then I suppose the thing that got, that, that got you through afterwards, that, like, you know, as we would expect from the GA and in rural Ireland and everything, the community really kind of rallied around and, Boyed you and the lads through all the, the funeral and the aftermath. They did all, yeah, and yeah. and they still do. You know, I, yeah. I wouldn't be able to cope with it. But the neighbours and friends, and, and I think the good in people, and and that's part of what I'm saying in the book. Yeah. Maybe we don't talk to our family and our friends when we have issues and problems. Yeah. And I didn't. You know, I kept it to myself, and I uh -huh. had myself convinced I was dealing with everything, and I wasn't. And all I had to do was the lads around me could see it, but I couldn't see it. So. So like, and what you're referring to now is that afterwards, and you admit this in the book, you you kind of. Uh, went off the rails, a bit, bit of drinking and fighting, an awfully behaviour for, for a while after. Really yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not what the book is about. It's more, it's more about my own state of mind. And it wasn't even, it was even, I think, in the period, in the few years, like, I, I probably didn't sleep for three years, I'd say. Three really? or four years. Yeah, I just couldn't sleep. I'd go to bed at night and I'd be, instead of, I'd be wrecked going to bed, but then I'd, my mind would come alive and start thinking about things. And, um, and then after, the, yeah, I don't really remember the three months after Adele died. I, I was, uh, during the week I was grand, the lads were going to school and I, yeah. I, was, I was mad to get back into routine. They went straight back to school. I went straight back to work. And I didn't sort of take any time out. I thought this was the best way. And I was ready for it. And I knew about it for three years and all this. But at the weekends then, everyone was mad to take the kids. And I was going on the beer. But it was just I became bad company. And 
I kind of lost respect for people, which was when I realised that I'd done it, it was very hard to take because the one thing I'm, I like about life is people. I have great time for people, love. Yeah. all walks of life. And you came to a situation where your friends didn't kind of were saying, it, look, we don't want to go with you Well, anymore. they didn't say it, but they said it afterwards, yeah, that yeah. I was, you know, I was getting into arguments. Like if something came up, it said I was having a bit of crack, which we always did, we had a great laugh. Yeah. I was getting into sort of arguments and this, and there was a couple of fights as well, actually, fist fights and bits like, yeah. bits and pieces, a bit like the Wild West now and again. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it was bad stuff now and uh, yeah. crazy stuff to be going on with. So lucky enough, after, you know, maybe four or five months after Adele died, I was, uh, there was an incident in Tullamore and I was lucky that no one was hurt and I wasn't hurt and some of the, the lads, you know, a few of the lads said to me, look, this has to stop and sat me down and chatted me and it was a big turning point and I still didn't realise it when they said it to me, I was still saying it's someone else's fault, but there was actually, there was a moment of realisation where yeah. I could see that it was me, it was the problem and not anyone else and it was a, it was a big, big turning point and, you know, yeah. I'm not saying, look, it, it's, you know, I'm not perfect by any means, but yeah. I'm getting on with things now and I'm in yeah. a better frame of mind. Good. And listen, thank, thanks for, for telling us the story. I know it can't be hard to sit here going over it all again, but uh, I do think it's a story well worth telling. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Dyden. <laughs> <laughs> And Michael's book, Life, Death and Hurling, is on sale now, and it, re it really is a beautiful book. Uh, a reminder of our conversation.